Now we get to our next presentation, uh, Langebaan Lagoon on Film. Isn't that a wonderful way to put it? Langebaan Lagoon on Film. And we're privileged to have Dr. Alison Koch, who's a marine biologist, scientific services, Cape Research Center, South African National Park, Sand Parks. Now, I've got a, a CV of both Alison and her assistant, but this is, I'm, I'm not the scientist. Dr. Barry Clark should actually read this because it's in scientific language, so I'm going to give it a go. Um, Dr. Alison uh, Koch is a marine biologist, and I've accepted where. Her research interests are studying the ecological role and behavior of top predators in temperate uh, ecosystems, from sharks to the African penguins. She evaluates the effectiveness of the marine protected areas and monitoring species of conservation concern. She leads research, long-term ecological monitoring, and science management activities in marine protected areas, MPAs, under the management of sand parks from Namakwa up on our Vescas, uh, right the th way through to Agulhas, including the West Coast National Park, which is now changing its name to Vescas Na National Park. <laughs> uh, she completed a PhD uh, at K University of Cape Town and has published more than 60 scientific papers, technical reports, and also book chapters. Um, she ensures that scientific information is effectively converted into management and policy actions, underlined. Because it doesn't help we do all this and we don't convert that into executable implementation policy actions. She serves on several national scientific and technical working groups, including Scientific Authority of South Africa, the Top Predator Scientific Working Group, the National Marine Biology Biodiversity Scientific Working Group, uh, the Seabird, Shark and Marine Mammal Technical Teams of the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment, and non-profit organizations, Shark Spotters and South African Whale Disentanglement Network. What a CV. Fantastic. But she's got an assistant, like the mayor too. He has, also has an assistant. You can't do this on your own. And Sisanda Mayakisu is her assistant, and she'll also be part of the presentation. Sisanda is a junior marine scientist at the Cape Research Center at the National Sand Parks. She conducts research and long-term ecological monitoring in several marine protected areas with a focus on monitoring rocky shores in Namakwa National Park and marine fish and shark abundance and diversity using underwater cameras in West Coast, Table Mountain, and Robben Island marine protected areas. She has a MSc in mole molecular, molecular rather, fish genetics, and there's a word there that I can't pronounce, so I'm going to leave that word. And she got that uh, MSc from the Rhodes University uh, and was a WWF graduate leader in turn before joining St. Parks. And she's now worked for Sand Parks for five years. So we're privileged to have speakers of this caliber here today. And it's a unique presentation. So I'm going to call to the fore Dr. Uh, Alison Cock first. And uh, Alison, you're going to take us underwater. We're going to be submerged. OK, you want to use the mic. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Thank you so much to the Trust for um, inviting us here to present to you. So Sunda and I have attended the State of the Bay annual review for five years now, and we've sat in the audience like you have, and uh, every year we've said, oh, we need to present our results at some time. And, uh, and then this year, I've made the proposal to the trust, and, uh, and they accepted it, so thank you so much. And, uh, and now we are all nervous because we're much more comfortable working on a small boat at sea than standing here talking to a big group of people. But uh, we do believe that it's incredibly vital to communicate what we've been doing as sand parks in the lagoon and um, tell you a little bit more about that and then um, just uh, tell you a little bit more about the future work that we're going to be doing. So Sasanda and I, 
will be sharing this presentation. I'll start off and then halfway through Susanda will continue. And we really are presenting um, as part of a team. We can't do this work alone. Um, we've got our colleagues from West Coast National Park here um, and a lot of our colleagues from Cape Research Center here as well. So this is a large team. It takes a lot of work uh, to, to do this work, um, to work at sea for, for long hours. We often work from sunrise until sunset. We're out on a boat um, and uh, sometimes we get stuck in the lagoon and uh, people need to climb out and push us off the sandbanks. Um, sometimes it's windy, sometimes it's sunny, sometimes it's rainy. Um, so we really do value all the commitment um, from our colleagues, the rangers, the managers, the environmental monitors um, and, and our scientists. So why is it important to uh, monitor, to care? Well, I do work across a very large area, all the way from Namakwa to Agalis. Um, I've worked in areas in the Eastern Cape, and we do have a lot of human activities that are impacting on the environment. And I see firsthand how those impacts have tipped the balance, where we've gone too far over onto the one side, and uh, we don't have a healthy environment left anymore. So it's a real privilege to be able to work in West Coast National Park, particularly in the lagoon, because it reminds me of why we do what we do. It gives me hope that we can find balance between um, the needs of people and uh, a healthy environment. And um, it is a real privilege to be able to work in an environment that sustains so many livelihoods. The lagoon is incredibly important for nature. It's a breeding area for many of our fish, which are important for fishing, livelihoods, and a way of life. Um, it's a nursery area for those fish, and those fish depend on a healthy, clean environment. And it's incredibly important for people all the way from using the lagoon to de-stress. We all lead very stressful lives. We need a place that we can de-stress, that we can relax, that we can find some inner peace. It's incredibly important for tourism. We know the diverse amount of tourist activities and companies and businesses that rely on this healthy environment. And it's incredibly important for livelihoods as a way of life. Many of uh, the traditions are based on vescus on its marine life, on its resources, um, our, our recipes, you know, our food, what we eat is based on these resources. So it's incredibly important uh, that we make sure that those uh, benefits that we get from nature, we can continue to get from nature so that we can have the lives that we were used to or where we would like to see our lives go. But of course, there are many pressures on this environment and we, going to hear a lot more about those pressures from, uh, from Dr. Barry Clark today. And um, we're going to um, understand a little bit more about what those pressures do on the environment. But it's incredibly important for us to understand how the ecosystem works. Um, and so it's, and that is because we need to understand how it works, what the populations are doing, what their health status is, identify any potential pressures, threats, and the reason for that is so that we can find solutions. It's important not to identify threats, but also to find ways that we can work together and solve any of the problems that we are seeing and to solve them in a timeless way. It's no point monitoring 20 years too late and now we've missed the boat to actually find a solution to the problem. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about a different kind of monitoring method that we have been trialing in Langebaan Lagoon, particularly in the marine protected area. And um, this really is to complement the existing monitoring that has been conducted by Barry and his team and other people working in the bay. And essentially what it is, is uh, BRUVs, baited remote underwater video cameras or video surveys. And what these are is a, a new technique that has been quite popular around the world in marine environments, kelp forests, coastal rocky shore areas, but it is used less rarely in these kind of ecosystems, embayments or estuaries. And so we really wanted to 
test whether this method would work in the lagoon because we've been using it in uh, Table Mountain National Park, we've been using it in Titsikama, we've been using it at Robben Island, and so we thought let's trial it in the estuary to see if it could actually work. So that was our primary goal. Um, another goal was to understand what species these cameras would detect in the bay. We know that in comparisons from other parts of the world that this system picks up a lot more species compared to traditional monitoring methods when you um, catch and release or you use nets or you use scuba counts. Um, this system has traditionally picked up a lot more species so we want to understand what it would pick, uh, pick up. And then it also allows us to get an index of abundance of um, species that we are most interested in such as white stump nose, elf, um, smooth hound sharks, um, all very important commercial uh, species. So uh, what it is really is a, a steel frame in the picture. You can see it's a, it's a steel frame. It's about one meter long. On the one side, there's a canister that we fill with sardine. And on the other side, there is a small c uh, camera. And essentially, we deploy this on the sea floor, and then we watch uh, the video footage to see what is attracted to the bait canister. So it's a non-invasive technique. We don't have to catch the fish um, and it's low cost and the videos are there forever. So that 10 years from now, if someone has a different question about the environment, they can go back and have a look at those videos. It's a record forever and we have very special ways of storing this information so that in 20 or 30 years time it will be available for other people to use. So what I'm going to show you now is how we deploy this. So as I said, we're much more comfortable on the boat. <laughs> um, and Essentially, this is um, from August this year. We were doing our winter sampling and uh, we've got the, um, the West Coast team on the boat and you can see the steel frame in here with the sardines in the bait canisters and then there's um, a, a very special way to actually deploy this camera so that it lands straight on the sea floor. And, um, and as you can see here, you might be able to see in the bait canister, you can see a little bit of that scent of the sardine that is coming out. That's what's going to attract your fish. And, uh, and, and once we've got it nice and straight, we then drop it down on the sea floor. And essentially, it stays there for a minimum of one hour. And um, this is a standardized approach that we use, um, using sardine and um, the, the one hour. And then when we are ready to retrieve it, whoops, um, when we are ready to retrieve it, then um, it will stay there for an hour. And um, what we also get is um, the habitat type. So for example, you see the, the sand here it's really important for us when we retrieve these cameras to come directly over the camera and lift it to the surface um, so that we don't drag it along the, the bottom of the ocean. And uh, we lift it up and um, get it on the boat and we deploy these at a minimum 10, ten times per day um, across the different zonations of the uh, marine protected area. Um, so that's how we deploy them, that's how we retrieve them, and um, we have done, so far we've deployed um, them across the different zonations of the marine protected area. We've deployed them 130 times since February 2019. We've done seven field trips uh, to date, most of them in summer, unfortunately COVID meant that we missed two winter seasons. Um, so we completed our second winter season in August this year. We've deployed them across the sanctuary zone of the marine protected area, the, um, the restricted zone, the controlled zone, and then we started to deploy them in the um, Saldana Bay area as well. But unfortunately, the visibility was often really poor in the Bay area because there's a lot of productivity, it's often lots of plankton blooms. And, um, and so we actually stopped that because we couldn't see the bait canister anymore. Um, so we are concentrating in the lagoon and we're also hoping to extend to the islands and 16 mile beach um, on the Atlantic side as well. 
So what I'm going to do now is um, sh show you some of the fun part of um, what these videos actually tell us. Uh, so Langebahn on film. Um, so I'm going to show you a series of uh, videos now. Oh, before that, how we do this. So the fun part is being at sea, deploying these, um, and then when we come back home, we have to analyze this. And for every one hour of video footage we get is three to four hours of analyzing that data. And um, to date, my colleague Sasanda has done the, the vast majority of that work. And that means she has to watch that video footage, she has to stop it, play it, identify all the species. She needs to record those, she needs to record the time that she sees the species, and then she also needs to get an index of abundance from each species so that we can um, get the diversity of species and then also the abundance. And again, this is a lot of work that happens in the background which um, Sasanda has been leading. So here's some of the videos um, and, and these are some of the, um, the popular species. Who knows what these are? Ah, there we go. <laughs> so uh, stinkies, um, these are nice and abundant in the, in the marine protected area and you can see a nice shoal of uh, stinkies there. They love to be on film. Um, they seem to be very interested in, um, in the cameras and it's really fantastic to see these kind of um, uh, species interacting because often we just get to see them when they've been caught, you know, or they're on shore and we don't get to see them um, like this. So this is another video um, and, you know, you can see sometimes the visibility is quite green but you can still see what is going around. And um, we need to watch these videos, we need to record each species, and then of course it's exciting when you see these uh, special visitors coming around. Who knows what that one is? It's a smooth hound, spotted smooth hound shark. Um, a very, very important area for the species as a breeding and a nursery area. This is another video and um, sometimes you can imagine it's exciting, there's lots of action, but sometimes there's a lot of watching nothing, but you still have to watch it. <laughs> so <laughs> no data is data. <laughs> and, um, and so it is really fortunate when you have um, uh, a visitor that comes in. Um, is the video playing? Yes. Um, so that's a little um, puff at a shy shark. This is a critically endangered species. They are afforded protection in the MPA. Uh, they are not targeted specifically by fishermen, but in many of our trawl fisheries that happen just offshore, they are caught in their thousands as bycatch. So um, the species has been listed as critically endangered, but it does get protection from the marine protected area. Uh, what's also really nice is you get to see some really interesting behavior. So uh, you can see this special species um, making a turn. This species is not interested in the bait canister. It's interested in what's being attracted to the bait canister. So we get to count the elf as well. And we've got quite a nice um, a lot of videos with these predatory species in them. Um, so again, showing the diversity of the species that we are able to detect and also the behavior that we are able to see um, from, from these species. This is one of our, um, our, our wonderful videos. This is from the sanctuary zone in um, the lagoon. And um, it's really fantastic. You know, when you hear all this negativity and all this doom and gloom, to see videos like this where you've got black tail and you've got white stump nose and you've got elf, it's just absolutely incredible to go, wow, there are still places of hope. And, um, and it just gives us that extra effort to um, to work harder to make sure that we have these spaces that uh, fish can still breed and can still um, make sure that you know we can we can catch them sustainably when we need to. And then this is the last video I'm going to show you today. Um, there's a little crab. Sometimes the crabs really love to climb on the cameras, but we've got um, lots of juvenile fish. Can you see those at the bait canister? There's hundreds and hundreds and then 
a visitor from out of space, the cuttlefish coming to have a look. So what's really nice to see from the cameras is that in the sanctuary zone, we've got thousands of juvenile fish, um, Cape silversides, um, for example, that are attracted to the bait canisters. And, um, and those are really difficult to get an index of abundance of, um, and that takes an extra couple of hours. Um, but we need to do it systematically. We need to make sure that we can use these cameras and the data collected from these cameras um, for meaningful um, evidence that we can use. And um, Sasande is now going to take us through some of the um, results that we've got from the last few surveys. Um, so thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, <laughs> okay, it's just cool to see the videos um, of what we have been doing here at West Coast National Park. Um, but unfortunately, we would love to see something that's happening in the Saldana Bay, but because of the visibility, we couldn't do so. So we've got some interesting results. Um, with our um, uh, videos that we have, we have identified 19 species in total coming from 14 families and in our table as you can see here we do have some um, we do have some um, fish and sharks and rays that are globally recognized as near threatened or vulnerable. So um, in out of these 19 species that we have found here in our fish and rays that we have identified, we have four abundant fish, namely which is your Cape Silverside, your Superclip fish, your White Stump Nose, and your Stinky. And we can see that they are mostly abundant, for example here with your White Stump Nose and your Superclip, uh, and your superclip fish, they are mostly abundant in, uh, in Zone A. And then for the Cape Silverside, as you have seen from the videos, the ju those juveniles, they are mostly abundant in Zone B. And then your Stenki in Zone C. And we can see that they are mostly abundant during the summer season. So this actually coincides with when these um, fish and those sharks that they are breeding uh, during that time. Which, means, which shows that, that the lagoon plays a very important role for these fish and these sharks because it is um, playing a very critical role when these juveniles, for example, your Cape Silverside, they're using the estuary, um, they're using the estuary for nursery and uh, also the um, white stump nose is also using this estuary because it's spawning that time. So those babies, even though it spawns in the, in the sea, in the case of West Coast, it spawns in the bay, and then those juveniles, the larval stage, they have been taken care of in the um, Langaban Lagoon. So it is very important, as the mayor has mentioned, that we have to work together, and we have to work together and be one, and take care of our Langaban Lagoon, so that we can make sure that it's in a healthy state, because that's where the lava, the juveniles, and the eggs, they have been taken care of. Okay. With our next slide, for uh, we have these four graphs that we have here, so I'll keep it as simple as possible, not to be that scientific. So, um, for this presentation here, for the audience, I'll concentrate more in the abundance and in the diversity. So, what we are finding here, we are finding that there's a high uh, abundance in zone B, and we are also finding um, high diversity in zone A. So, in zone A, the possible explanation that we are finding different a variety of species in zone A is because zone A is much more deeper. And some of the fish, they, there's also a complex structure of habitat there. So that some of the fish, they prefer the reefs, where they can be able to hide away from the predators. So some of the fish, they prefer the vegetation because it's got a complex habitat structure, the vegetation that they can feed on, and some of those juveniles, since it's a nursery area, they can use those vegetation to hide from the predators. So it also makes sense that in zone B, we've got a high abundance. We've got a lot of um, <coughs> fish, fish there. So it makes sense because there's the limited activities that are happening there. Another possible explanation could be that some of those fish, they might prefer shallow or sandy habitat. 
So here, looking at our communities, um, we are seeing that during the summer season, in red, we are having a lot of fish communities during the summer season, which coincides with the time where they are spawning and then using the lagoon as a nursery area. And also, maybe the, also for the, those juveniles, which is very critical uh, for the food availability for them to be able to grow. And then when they have grown up, they become adults, they migrate back to the, to the bay in this case. And then in winter, they, uh, we don't find them, we don't uh, find them a lot in our videos. So it means that they might be migrating to the bay. So, and we only identify few of those fish or those sharks that are left in the lagoon, which are showing a residency. And then here, with our fish communities, as we are looking at our zone A and zone B. Zone A, that's a lot of activities that are happening there, the swimming, kite surfing, um, and fishing as well. But we find that, that zone A is quite different from zone B and C. So, as we are looking at it, that zone, those fish that are preferring zone A and B, the possible explanation is that there are limited activities that are happening there. The central area, there's nothing happening there. So, they might be using those areas for protection and also for the juveniles to be using them. Uh, maybe they prefer shallower um, habitats and sand habitats. And then when we are looking at zone A, it's quite different from zone B and C. That makes sense because some is it pulling away to the depth side, which shows that some of these fish, they prefer to be in a zone A when, where, they, um, the, where there is a deeper waters. So here, um, we have the um, Stinky and white stump nose, which fishes are for quite more interested in this um, fish. And for the white stump nose, we know that it's a global recognized as a vulnerable species. But we are finding a similar trend here, where we are finding that in summer 2020, for the white stump nose and also for the stinky, we are finding that there is a high abundance during this time in 2020. Can you guess why we are finding and picking up some high abundancy during that time? Excuse me? Yeah, it was because lockdown. <laughs> Nothing was happening during this time. And we're so happy with our results that we have found because they actually similar, we're finding a similar pattern that has been found in the state of the Bay. As Barry Clark was presenting here in 2020 and 2021, they've also have picked up that some of the fish that they, um, they were uh, finding a high abundance during that time in 2020. And now in 2021, we're finding that they're starting to become low because now things were starting to become uh, back to normal and the, the restrictions were being lifted. So this is what we're having here with the stankies and our white stump nose. Uh, for our future plans, we are planning to continue with this work so that we can know what we are having and what we are finding out with our diversity and abundance and how our fish communities are working. But we have seen that with our facial sharks and rays, they're using the Lagaban Lagoon. It's very important to them as a nursery areas. And it also depends on the fish, on which zone they prefer to be, uh, be comfortable using. So it is very important to take care of the Langaban Lagoon because it plays a very important role for these fish. So think of it as a parent taking care of your child. So the environment has to be a good environment, healthy, so that these babies can be able to grow up. So now we will um, continue with our work and also extend it to the offshore islands, deploying Marcus, Mar in Marcus Island, Malchas, and also Jatin. And we also want to include the 16-mile beach by deploying these braves. And we want to upgrade. Actually, we do have the equipment already where we will be using these underwater videos, but we'll be using an underwater video that will be able to measure the size of the fish. Yes, and then since we're not finding a lot of, we'll continue with the winter 
sampling, but if we're not finding much in our videos, then we will continue with our annual, annual summer deployments. And as we acknowledge the State of the Bay report, we also have to take into consideration where we will have to also consider other physiochemical um, parameters where we have to record because we have seen from the results that we have a higher d different species that we were having higher diversity in zone A, which makes sense. So, but we need to record the salinity because according to the, re to the report, it says that the salinity, it increases with the um, high tide. And we're doing our sample during a high tide. Uh, we're doing our sampling during um, high tide. So when um, the salinity increases with the high tide, it proceeds, so they, it, there is, um, higher, it increases and has higher amounts. So uh, it makes the head of the bay, which is the upper reach of the lagoon, which is in zone A in this area. So it will make that area to become very marine dominated. And we know that with the Langaban Lagoon, we don't have fresh water input. We have the groundwater from the aquifer. So maybe that is why we are finding a lot of diversity in zone A. But we need to have a conclusive evidence by recording that in the future. Thank you. Wasn't that fabulous? Yeah, I think a uh, bigger applause. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well done. I'd like to ask uh, Pia, who's uh, in West Coast National Park, is one of our main actors there to please hand over to both Alison uh, and uh, uh, her assistant to come and hand this over. Okay, so that's going to go above her desk. So when she does her research, she does it in time. <laughs>